All right, thanks everyone for being with us today. We'll get started with uh, today's news conference shortly. Uh, first here with us today, uh, to my right, our U of L Acting President, Dr. Neville Pinto, Vice President and Director of Athletics, Tom Jurich, Head Basketball, Rick Patino, uh, Steve Thompson, a lawyer with Nixon Peabody who is working with the university as, as an outside counsel on this matter, and our outside consultant, Chuck Smirt, with the Compliance Group. There may be a couple of questions that are asked today that uh, that we ask the latter two individuals to uh, to answer for us. Uh, we'll start off now with a statement from Dr. Pinto. Thank you, Kenny, and good morning, folks, and thank you for joining us today. Today, we publicly release the notice of allegations received this week from the NCAA regarding our men's basketball program. The NCAA report aligns with the results of our inquiry. Improper activities took place in Minority Hall. I am grateful to the NCAA for their efforts in this case. It is important for the truth to be known and for us to deal responsibly with the results. This disturbing behavior is certainly not reflective of our core values as an institution respect and dignity for all individuals who set foot on our campus is at the center of who we are. From the start, the NCAA had our full cooperation. Their investigators spoke to numerous UFL employees and third parties. The university gave them every document they asked for. We wanted them to learn the truth that's the only way to handle something like this. Let me add that I am disappointed that former Director of Basketball, Basketball Operations, Andre McGee, did not cooperate with the investigators. The allegations underscore why it was appropriate for the university to self-impose punitive and corrective actions earlier this year. The penalties are among the most severe ever self-imposed by an NCAA member. You should also know that in addition to the penalties we imposed on our basketball program, Athletic Director Tom Jurich, working with Coach Patino, has taken a series of corrective measures in the areas of security and compliance. I have confidence in their ability to provide leadership in creating a culture that precludes this from happening again. The NOA does not contain an allegation that Coach Patino had knowledge of what took place in the dormitory. I am confident in Coach Patino, and I know he is and always has been committed to NCAA compliance. It appears that his subordinate, Mr. McGee, acted furtively. We appreciate the NCAA's efforts and we regret tremendously that this took place. We will continue to work cooperatively with the NCAA for the final re resolution of this matter. The entire episode is a deep disappointment for all of us who love this university. And it has been a sad and unsettling chapter in UFL's storied basketball program. Everybody who works at UFL understands that this can never happen again. I repeat, this can never happen again. Athletic Director Jurich, Coach Patino, and I will continue to work cooperatively with the NCAA for the final resolution of this matter. Our goal today is to share the information we have and to answer all questions that we can. At this time, I'd like to ask our athletic director, Tom Jurich, to provide his thoughts. Thank you, President Pinto. And last year, I told you that if there was something wrong, we would get to the bottom of it. We wanted to know the truth, and we pledged to deal with it. We now have the NCAA notice of allegations. As, print, as President Pinto said, the NCAA confirmed the sad truth that we learned earlier this year. Improper activities took place in a dormitory, and I am saddened and disappointed that this happened. It was wrong, and it was hard to fathom how anyone who worked here could have thought this was a good idea. I want to draw your attention to something important in the notice of allegations. It's what it did not say. 
The, the notice of allegation does not contain an allegation that Coach Patino had knowledge of what took place in the dormitory. The NCA does not allege a lack of institutional control at the University of Louisville, which would have been a very severe allegation. The NCA does not allege that there's a failure to monitor against the institution, which would also have been a severe allegation. The NCA does not allege that Coach Patino failed to promote an atmosphere of compliance, another which would have been a serious allegation. And, and I want to be real, really clear on this, and, and I hope everybody will listen to this. The, the, the notice of allegation does not contain does contain a narrow allegation, which we will dispute, and we will dispute this strong. That Coach Patino failed to monitor Andre McGee. Now, I worked beside Coach Patino for over 15 years. And most of you in this room know him very, very well. And I can tell you that he, if he ever caught a whiff of what was going on, he would have hit the roof. I, however, think it's a very fair question to ask. And as the athletic director here, I've asked it to myself a million times, should he have known? I've come to the conclusion that he could not have known. No matter what he did or how, how close he is to his players and staff, he could not have known. This activity was clearly kept from him Knowing how he would have reacted if he had known, I believe that Andre acted furtively, going, doing everything he could to keep this away from a coach who would never tolerate it. You know, it's been a tough year. We all know that. It's been a tough year with our basketball program. This was a big setback to us. Uh, we made a mistake. A, a member on our, on our staff made a terrible mistake. Uh, we said from day one, we found out we would own it. And I think we've done that. I think we've, we've got two excellent investigators in Chuck Smirt and Steve Thompson who had everything turned over to them along with the NCA that they could possibly do. We got out of the way to make sure that this was a very objective interview. You know, like I said, I, I, I take this very personal because I've worked with Coach for a lot of years. I see how important this is. I see the name that's on that building. I see the people that lived in that building. You know, uh, I relied on so many different red flags that I thought would have come to me. Social media. How did social media not ever have one release on this? I, those are the things I relied on and I didn't get. You know, I look for red flags all the time. I probably look for red flags too much of the time because I'm so protective of this program. This one got by me too. Uh, we were wrong and I want everybody to know that. We will not dodge this issue one bit. We're going to take it head on and we're going to fix it and and I want to get, continue to get to the bottom of it. I think the actions that we took and the penalties we imposed on ourselves were the right thing to do. It's important for universities to police themselves no matter how difficult it is. This is a time that we had to walk the walk and I believe that we've done that. Uh, we will continue to deal with this openly and directly. We will continue to work with the NCA and I look forward to a full and complete resolution of this matter. You know, I know Coach Patino, uh, he always has a lot of comments, and I know this time he would really like to make some as well. So thank you very much, Coach. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let me digress a little bit because it took place in this building. Um, I went to Dr. Ramsey 15 years ago or 14 years ago and asked him for a favor. Um, 15 plus years ago, um, a plane went through the World Trade Center. And it altered the life of my family considerably. Uh, and you don't know what to do when that hits. You don't know whether you cry, you console, but you don't know how to act. There's so many people from 9-11 that suffer so much today. So the best way to do it is to honor someone. And we tried it in a number of different ways. We have a statue of Billy Minotti and Timmy Coughlin at Old Memorial Golf Course where everybody high fives them as they come off of the 10th hole. I went to Dr. Ramsey and said, I'd like to build a dormitory in his name. And he said, Rick, I can't do it because I'd have to do it for women's basketball, for, for soccer, for other sports as well. I said, how about you give me a piece of land? I'll raise the $5 million, we'll build it, and I'll turn over the keys as a donation. He says, you can do that? I said, I'm certainly going to try. So from UK friends that I met when I, my time there, to U of L friends, and most important to the people in New York that knew Billy Minotti, they all donated their money, and we built that dorm. A very special place. On top of it, I convinced one of my managers, who's my nephew, 
to come to the University of Louisville because his dad, some five and a half months prior to that, was prior to 9-11, hailed a taxi in New York and got killed. So he came as a manager and had a great experience. Then I convinced my sister-in-law, Billy's wife, and their children to move here. We were going to build this dorm, and his children were going to live in that dorm. And the reason I bring all of this up, when this all broke, for a span of, because I don't believe in paranoia, but for a span of two weeks I had paranoia, what was going on here? Couldn't fathom any of this happening. We knew we had full security in the dorm. We knew we had managers living in the dorm, social media. Never even a hint of this ever came up. And the reason it never would come up to me in any way is everybody knew that if you were a player, you'd be immediately suspended. And if you were a coach, you would have been terminated immediately. They all knew that, so that's why it was kept from me. But I still didn't believe what was going on. And the only people I could trust in this situation, not security, not cameras, nobody, except my nephews who lived in that dormitory. One, right next to Andre McGee with his dad's name on that door. So for a five or six year span, they were in there. And I asked them, called them in and said, did you ever, ever see anything like this in your life? And they said, Uncle Rick, we've never seen anything go on there. And we would have come to you immediately. They were the only ones I could trust or believe in at that point of paranoia for those two weeks. Then the investigation started and I tried to get to the bottom of it and was told uh, not to speak to Andre McGee ever again and not to investigate on your own. And I complied with the NCAA and for the past 30 some odd years as a coach, uh, I believe in the NCAA. The people who, who investigated this were highly professional. They were fair. Do I agree with the failure to monitor one of my people? No, absolutely not. Uh, because I over-monitor my staff. But I'll say this in, in, in closing about this situation. From Tubby Smith to Jeff Van Gundy to Stu Jackson to Herb Sendek to Billy Donovan to Mick Cronin to Kevin Keats to Kareem Richardson to Ralph Willard to Jim O'Brien to Kevin Willard to my son and a host of others that have gone on to prosperity and become outstanding coaches and people. We're not, I'm not guilty of failing to monitor my staff. I'm guilty of trusting someone because none of those people would have risen to the heights that they've risen to. From Frank, I left out Frank Vogel and Brett Brown and a host of other people I left out, Scotty Davenport locally. The reason they became so responsible is I believed and trusted them. And all head coaches believe and trust in their assistant coaches because it's what coaches do. We're there for the student athlete. And this young man made a very big mistake and we apologize for his mistakes. We apologize to our fans, to our university many, many times. We don't believe in any of this. And more, most important, that dorm was built for a special person. And things were done that were not special. And we apologize for that. Thank you. All right, at this point, we will uh, we will take some questions. Just uh, anyone back in the back. Coach, you know, 15 total incidents, 17 recruits, two coaches over four years. Accepting that you didn't know, how is that not a failure to monitor the coach? Well, most everybody I've polled and talked to um, I asked a question of Mike Golick on ESPN. I said, did your coach at Notre Dame ever come in your dormitory? I know my coach never did at Massachusetts. I would say that most coaches don't go in a dormitory, but unfortunately that wasn't the case with me. I was always in that dormitory for a lot of reasons. We, wa we watched film the night before games there. Occasionally I'd go over and have breakfast. Occasionally I'd visit the guys. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not there from 10 o'clock in the evening to 4 in the morning. I'm just not. I don't expect any coach to be there, assistant coach or not. Um, so that's the way I would answer it. Um, 
I wish it would have leaked out to me because it would have been stopped immediately. Talk about the steps you've taken to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Well, understand that this is a dormitory with full security. And the way to stop it is, and I'll, I'll have that conversation with my team today. Large disappointment is that somebody who's seen this going on didn't come to me or come go to one of the assistant coaches and say, what's going on is wrong. We need to put a stop to it. So moving forward, I'm going to talk to my team today in a vague sense about a lot of different things that if you see something wrong, whether or not it's not snitching, it's not turning someone in, it's protecting your program. Because last year, two young men transferred from their schools with one dream to play in the NCAA tournament because they didn't have that opportunity at their schools. And they joined a terrific group of young men who worked all summer long. And on February 4th, when we took the NCAA away, we were a top 15 ranked basketball team. Matter of fact, we beat two teams that were in the Final Four. We had dreams of winning another championship. We had dreams of going to another Final Four, and that was all taken away. This was a highly ranked team that had a lot of dreams. And these players weren't involved in that. We did it because it was the right thing to do. When we got the information, I didn't get the information until very late from Tom that uh, two days prior to that of what went on. And um, the way to move forward is to convince everybody to look after each other if we see something wrong to come and stop it because a great team got hurt some terrific people got hurt along with a loyal fan base um, who really suffered from this because it's not what we're all about it's not what our fan base is about this is for time dr pinto so is it fair to say you're accepting four major We, we, we have not taken a position on each of them individually. We, we have acknowledged that we are going to dispute Coach, uh, Coach Patino's uh, failure to dispute the, the failure to monitor. But the, the action taken in February was based in part upon allegation number one. So we have already acknowledged that some improper activities occurred. We are, we are not in a position right now to tell you A through K what, what we're going to, what, what actions we're going to take. But as Tom has said, as Coach has said, in February, the decision was made. It's reasonable to include a violation occurred. We need to take action. Very decisive action was taken at that time. Now the whole, the, the rest of the, of the allegations are out. We're going to assess what our position is and at that point decide where we are and what level. Mr. Smarter, do you think that the money, they, at least $5,400 that came from Andre the I, we, we can't talk about any specifics with the allegation. Obviously, there is a, an amount provided in the notice of allegations, but other, other than confirming that the, yeah, that's, that's the amount, we, we can't speculate on source because, again, this is still an ongoing inquiry. You know what the source was that you can't tell? Or well, if, if you... The university nor the NCAA know the source. If, if you read the notice of allegations, it, it says the source of... It, it tells you their reason why they think that is the amount. Other than that, we cannot talk about anything to do with the money mentioned in the notice of allegations. But, Coach, Coach, is there a sense that the penalties you guys... This is also for Tino, Is there a sense that the penalties you guys have done is enough to satisfy what the NCAA has told I think that's a question we'll leave up to the NCAA. We, I don't think we want to get involved in that. We've, we've done what we feel is appropriate. We've had great guidance by Chuck, and, uh, you know, we just we wanted to take it head on, and I think we did that, but the, that's in the NCAA's hands. Given that Jerry, right here with Jerry East. Let's, let's well, the athletes that were exposed to this, what are we doing for them? Is seven teams or so on players that were in allegations? What are we doing to reach out to them, to explain to them? that the situation was inappropriate? Well, first of all, we don't know who they are. We can guess with some, but we don't know who they are. Is that? So the university yeah. excluded the names, isn't that correct? Well, yeah, the, the institution in its notice of allegations did receive the names of the individuals. That information was redacted. How, so coach, 
coach still may not know all the specific names of the individual. The institution knows that, obviously. Has the university determined if um, the recruits and or players who received impermissible benefits played on the uh, 2013 team, and if they did, will that championship have to be vacated? Well, I guess there's two parts to your question. One is, has the institution looked through to see who competed? As in any inquiry, that's part of the ongoing process of review. Whether a vacation of records penalty is appropriate, uh, we don't believe a vacation of records penalty is appropriate. That is on a long list of, of penalties that the Committee on Infractions can impose. So if possible. everybody would raise their hands, please, and I'll, I'll get to everybody right here. Considering the number of parties that were outlinked in the report, can you explain how nobody else on the staff knew about them and what possible incentive there was for Andre Mickey to do this? Oh, I, I, the, the allegations do obviously do not contain that anybody else had any knowledge of, of these of these situations that occurred in the dorm. I, 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 I'm not going to speculate on did anybody else know. We're dealing today with what's in the notice of allegations. Well, for uh, Mr. George, Mr. Smurf, uh, what is the timetable now? Now you've received them, you, you've made it clear that you intend to dispute some of the things in it. What is the timetable for a response and moving this along? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, the timetable now is that the university will have 90 days to file its response to the notice of allegations. The uh, NCA enforcement staff then has 60 days to reply to that, and presumably the matter will be set down for a hearing before the Committee on Infractions sometime next spring. Chase? And, uh, this is for uh, Mr. George and Ms. Patino. Uh, you guys have disputed the claim of the failure to monitor with Andre McGee. Is there a worry or maybe an expectation that individually Rick Patino could be sanctioned by the NCAA? Tom, could I just jump in there for a minute? I, I just want to clarify one thing. There's not a failure to monitor charge against uh, Coach Patino. There is a charge under the head coach responsibility legislation. One sub uh, aspect of that, uh, it the head coach responsibility legislation creates a rebuttable presumption. One way you, you uh, rebut that presumption is by demonstrating that you, in fact, monitored uh, your program. Uh, the NCAA does not allege that Coach Patino did not monitor his program, which would have been a more significant charge. Uh, in this case, they've only alleged that he failed to rebut the presumption because he failed to, in some aspect, monitor uh, Coach uh, Andre McGee. And that's what we intend to uh, dispute. Is there a worry of, of sanctions that may come with that if the NCAA disagrees with the rebuttal? Well, the question of the penalties will be for the Committee on Infractions. We will certainly uh, address that with the Committee and in our response, which we'll file within 90 days. Eric. This is a two-part question. Is, are these level one standard violations or level one aggravated violations? And the second part is, just to be clear, because it matters so much to so many fans, if players involved in this are found to be on that national championship team, is taking down the banner one of the possible things that the NCAA could do. The, the Committee on Infractions ultimately decides whether uh, a, K, a, a level is standard or aggravated or, or, or mitigated. That, so at this point, as is the uh, is in the notice of allegations, they are alleged as level one. When the action was taken in February, we realized level one was a possibility. So the actions taken at that time were somewhat based upon the possibility that they could be level one. Regarding your question about vacation of records, as I said earlier, vacations of records is, uh, is on a long list of potential penalties that can be imposed in any case. However, I know precedent, some of you have speculated on precedent, how you get to a vacation of records penalty is either as a penalty itself or as an application of an use of an ineligible player. So again, there's precedent on both sides how you could get to that. So again, we're not going to speculate on that. We don't believe that vacation of records is appropriate. If so, we would have applied it. Uh, Tim. Uh, Mr. Smirk, uh, do you think that the $5,400 or whatever the amount was 
constitutes an extra benefit and therefore raises all the billing issues from the players involved? Well, I think if you if you look at the notice, the the majority of the of the student athletes who are mentioned, they they have the label of prospects. So if anything happened with them, it would be a recruiting inducement as opposed to an extra benefit. So that it's a distinction on which how you classify the violations. I don't know if that answered the the well, second part of your were question. Players, right? I'm sorry. Some of them were active players. We don't have names. Uh, the majority of the individuals who were listed were prospects who were visiting the institution on on um, uh, on visits. So, did some eventually uh, enroll at the institution? That is possible, but uh, again, we're not going to speculate on on uh, that. Would be going further than than the notice of allegations. But some were active players at the time. I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I, un, I understand. We can, the allegation says some were prospects when they were here. The allegations does not go into who eventually enrolled. So we can't, we can't say who, who eventually enrolled. And what's the distinction uh, in terms of NCAA sanctions between uh, violations and prospects? Not, well, the one's a recruiting inducement, one's an extra benefit. As it runs toward the, the long list of penalties, they're, they're about the same. Well, for uh, Coach Patino, you, you mentioned discussing this with the team. What will you, how will you address this with them, and, and are, you, are you encouraging them or allowing them to, to take a look at, at the notice? No, I won't. This team has absolutely nothing to do with that, and they would not understand it either. Uh, it's really very complicated in many ways, and, and uh, but I am going to tell them that the way to monitor any program the right way is to have each other's back the correct way. And if you see something wrong, uh, wherever it may be, protect each other and immediately come to the coaches. This question uh, for Coach Patino, do you want to know the 17 names in the notice of allegations, and how does it make you feel differently about those teams that you've mentioned re-energized you the last few years? Well, I know some of the names because of the uh, uh, the enforcement committee asked me about did I know about the prospects that came here most. Um, and so I, I, I know the names of the prospects that I was told that. But there's no reason to mention any names because they're not here. Eric? I guess for Tom, a Coach mentioned that he would talk to the team. What other measures will you take to the NCAA to say we're putting these in, in effect so that, you know, we have a, some type of systematic uh, check on these things? Going well, well, I think the first thing we'll look at is always the security. We, you know, we, we felt that we had strong security in place. Obviously, that didn't didn't work completely. We'll make sure that we upgrade that in any way, any way or fashion that we can. And number two, we'll look at our compliance and making sure that we're compliant with everything we possibly do over there. And I think number three is what Coach has already alluded to, the communication factor. That's the thing that we want to rely on. Will these get these kids comfortable enough to come talk to us when there's a wrong? Steve? Remember, can, you, uh, can you explain what Brandon Williams' role was on the team, what, what he may have Brendan Williams did not have a relationship with Andre, nor was Andre here when Brendan Williams was here. Um, I'm not sure with, uh, what that's all about, so I'll let these guys talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that charge is, is really unrelated to allegation one in the notice of allegations. Um, you know, it, I, I would say that at every turn in this investigation, the University of Louisville encouraged everyone to cooperate and come forward and and provide whatever information they had and we're disappointed that some individuals did not but uh, that said that that is really unrelated to uh, the core allegations here Jeff just to go back to what you were saying before so you mentioned the vast majority were recruits not from prospective student athletes were there any people who were actually on the team when these violations occurred and that I think is more of a well, uh, let me, I'll clarify and make sure that, I, that I, I said it correctly. The vast majority of these activities occurred with prospects who were coming on unofficial or official visits. 
how many of those eventually enrolled at this institution, I cannot get into because that would be getting into the specifics of the case. Chase. For, for uh, any, I guess anybody up there, was, was there anything in the notice of allegations that was uncovered the week the decision was made to institute the postseason ban? Or was that a culmination of things that you had uncovered in the investigation? Yeah, I think that, I think when we did the press conference in February, uh, it was mentioned by Tom and, and, and by the president that at that point there was a report that I made to the, to the institution which basically was a summarization of the inquiry to date. And at that point, the decision was made, yes, it's reasonable to conclude violations occurred. Tom's position all along has been once we know something on a, on a more definitive basis, he wanted to take action. And that's why in February that action was taken. Eric? Yeah, this question is for Tom. A show cause has ended the career of other basketball coaches. Why should this instance be different in your eyes? Because we don't agree with it. Because you don't agree, we with, don't agree with it. And we will fight, flag. we will dispute that. But it specifically says that the lack of monitoring basically says the coach should have been looking for the red flag, should have done more to know. Why do you disagree with that? Um, I think that we'll look into that as we will with the NCAA, and that'll be between us and the NCAA. That'll be their decision. But we feel very strongly that Coach Patino had nothing to do with this, had no knowledge of this. And, and, and believe us, we've, we've scoured it. And uh, there's no question in my mind that he could have even known anything about this. So we will dispute that the whole way through. And, and, and just as a clarification, and I think most of you know this, the enfor it's the responsibility of the enforcement staff to allege violations if they believe it's appropriate. It's the Committee on Infractions who will ultimately make findings, which we anticipate uh, a hearing to be held in the spring. So at this point, that's an allegation. The Committee on Infractions, another entity within the NCA, ultimately will determine what, if any, findings and or penalty should be assessed. At this point, that's an allegation. Well. For Mr. Jurich, has there been any communication between your office and anyone with the ACC now that the letter's been received about any, any steps that the conference may want to take? Yes, I've talked with the commissioner, and he, he'll leave that all up to us. All right. I actually know there was quite an outcry last year with the self uh, penalty. Does this, does this notice justify that in your mind now? I'm not looking for any justification, and, and believe, believe me, that 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 uh, penalty was 100% on my back. I said if, when we'd find out, we'd deal with it appropriately. It was the hardest, one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my entire career. It was hard to tell coach. It was equally harder for him to tell the team. It was hard to tell our fans. It was especially hard to tell those two young men, Damian and Trey, who had given and poured their hearts out for our program. But the buck stops here with me. I'm the athletic director. I felt at the time that was the most appropriate de decision. I will stand by that, but I'm certainly not looking for any justification. We'll take two more. Anybody? Yes, Coach, sir. you know, what personal toll has this taken on you and has it tarnished your legacy? Well, you've been very, um, your questions are quite interesting to say the least because you're not listening to the people who are talking. So um, when for the last 30 some odd years, I've been extremely compliant to every NCAA rule because I don't believe in an unfair advantage. I never asked a shoe company to help me out with a player, uh, just the opposite. Uh, the championship team had a two-star athlete become a first-team college All-American. The center was, wasn't even ranked, Gorky Zhang starting for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Young man who transferred from George Mason because his coach went to Miami, came in and he was the most outstanding player. So I don't look at it as a legacy. It's not about that. I don't look about tarnishing. I've been compliant as a head coach to the NCAA rules. It's my personal opinion that this is over. It's my personal opinion. But that's not for me to say. It's for the infractions committee to say. They are the judge and jury to all of this. We will present our case. I'm just giving you honesty about what I know, what I didn't know, what I believe in. And um, I believe in my players. I believe in my coaches who have gone on to successful careers. And uh, I believe in this university. And uh, we will do the right things for the student athlete.
Academically, this place is, um, with our program has, in three different conferences, held the highest grade point average. This university right now has a lot of great things happening. Our baseball team was ranked number two in the nation. Our soccer team's top 10, our football team's top 10. Our, we are currently ranked 14th going into the season. Our women's program is top five, putting a lot of heat on me. And um, it's uh, something very special that's happening right now, but we're dealing with a very difficult thing that will be in, the, in our rear view mirror very soon because we've been transparent, we tell the truth, and by telling the truth, your problems become part of your past. So I'm not interested in my legacy when it comes to that. Last question right here. Uh, Coach, you know, we've heard from other people at the table about their frustrations that Andre refused me with the Are you frustrated that he essentially has gone into hiding? To be perfectly honest, I can't answer that question because I've spoken to Andre McGee one time. Uh, really wasn't much of a speech. It was a little bit of yelling. And um, Andre has been advised by his attorney not to speak. Um, so I, I can't honestly give you an answer to that because none of us have spoken to Andre McGee. We've done exactly what the NCAA has asked us to do. They, like I said earlier, they have been very professional in what they've done. These two gentlemen here have been great to work with. They know that we want transparency, to the total truth with all of it. Uh, we have a lot of questions that we'd love to have answered, but probably we'll never get answers. Uh, what Rick brought up, something is, is what I wonder each night, the why part. I just don't get it, the why part. I just want to follow up on that uh, to finish, and I think I can speak for Chuck in saying that the University of Louisville has gone above and beyond in its efforts to get to the truth in this case. Uh, at the outset of this case, we were asked to follow these facts wherever they might lead, uh, regardless of where they might lead, and they put no limits on what we could do just to find the truth. Um, and that is to the great credit of the administration of this university and to Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Pinto and Tom Jurich and Coach Patino. Uh, we're, we're not sure that uh, there's anything more this university could have done to investigate this and get to the truth. And I just want to say that we really appreciate that support and the cooperation that they've given to the NCAA. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being here today.